Okay, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, I am Fatma Ash from East Pakistan, uh, the president of the uh, of the Civil Student Society. Um, so uh, I want to welcome you all here as our first event of the year as newly forming student society. And as we all know, uh, liberalism you know affects our daily life a lot from every point, every aspect, uh, more than just the youth and the family. It impacts, it impacts your, our life in, like, from society to family, to politics, to work ethics, and it touches almost everything. And therefore, we have our honor, honorable guest, Hamid Hijab, today, to talk about liberalism here. And to to talk about Muhammad Hijab a little bit in full, uh, he's a British debater and public speaker of Egyptian descent who engaged in discussions and polemics on a wide variety of topics, including religion, politics, and society. He completed a BA in politics and MA in history from Queen Mary University. He has taught and instructed courses on humanities and languages in many contexts. He has numerous ijazat in some Islamic sciences and has studied in multiple Islamic seminaries, including the, Shin including the Shinkiti Institute, which employs a traditional Mauritanian style of teaching the sacred sciences. Muhammad is um, currently doing further postgraduate research in Islamic studies at Salas University of London. So uh, I would like to invite brother up to the stage to have his speech. No. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa um, This topic of liberalism is a very, very important one. Not least because liberalism is the leading ethic of the Western world. And obviously the Western world, which is the Europeans and their extensions, which is America now, are the hegemonic powers of the world. So to talk about liberalism is to talk about a very important topic, which I believe in our circles as Muslims is um, not spoken about as much as it should be. There was a time where maybe in Islamic circles we thought that the global competitor to um, Islamic ethics was other religions. So we'd think, for example, of Christianity, we'd think, for example, of potentially Hinduism, and so on. But research suggests to us that liberalism is more powerful in terms of demographic effect than all of those religions, and could be said to be in many ways more penetrating than even the Islamic ethic, ironically even in Muslim countries. So it's a very important topic to discuss. And I want to divide what I'm going to talk about today into three different subsections. I don't want to spend too much time here talking. I want to spend a little bit more time interacting so that we can have a question and answer session. We have an all-star cast from uh, London, inshallah. So it's not just going to be me taking the um, questions. It's going to be me, Brother Zakir. Hussein, Brother Hashem, and Brother Mansour, who you guys might be familiar with, um, all of which have their kind of subject-specific specialism and have engaged in numerous debates uh, in and of themselves. So that's something, inshallah, we can look forward to. So I'm going to divide this discussion into three different parts, just for brevity and conciseness. The first thing I'm going to talk about is the discussions surrounding liberalism in academia the discussions surrounding liberalism in academia. And in this we're talking about, we're going to be talking about some of the common critiques of liberalism by, you know, um, academics in the Western world, for example. The second thing we're going to talk about are the problems with liberalism, even as identified by liberals themselves. Some of the uh, issues when you put liberalism in practical impl implementation, what are some of the issues with liberalism? And number three, we're going to be talking about 
the, well, there's a big word here, I'm going to try and simplify it when we get to it, but the epistemological problem of, uh, of liberalism. Meaning, how do we get to know if li liberalism is true? Can we prove it's true? And so on. And I've done an essay on this, you can check on salam.org.uk on the publication section. This was um, what I focused on in the essay, the epistemological problem of liberalism. So these are the three things, and obviously we'll link this to Islamic society uh, and so on. So just to get started with this, in terms of liberalism, in terms of the academic discussions that are had by academics, you could say there have been many different kinds of critiques levied against liberals by different Western um, scholars. For example, very famous is the Marxist critique of economic liberalism. The Marxist critique of economic liberalism. And liberalism itself should not be seen as one monolithic thing. It's divided into social, you know, some people, to, to, to make things simple, divided into social, economic, and political, yeah? So we have Marxist critiques, utilitarian critiques. I mean, even Jeremy Bentham himself attacked uh, what would be then referred to as liberalism. But what's become quite popular nowadays is something called the a communitarian critique of uh, liberalism. Communitarian. Now, who are the communitarians? The communitarians are basically a group of scholars like Charles Taylor and Michael Sandel who say that liberalism is problematic because it re references the individual in abstractation. In other words, human beings are not individualistic by psychological and social necessity. They are more communal creatures, hence the name communitarian. So they say that why do we give, they ask the question, why do we give primacy, why do we prioritize the individual over and above, for instance, familial or communal units? Why is it that the individual, they ask, yes, is prioritized through human rights? Because if you look at, for example, the UN human rights of the, the 30 articles of the UN human rights, you'll find that most of them, if not all of them, are centered around individual human rights. You don't really find as much emphasis, if any emphasis at all, on communal or fam familial rights. You don't find that. So the, the communitarians would argue, this is a problem. This is problematic. Because why is it that you've been given, why is it that you have this false presupposition that we are autonomous and independent? When in fact, the truth is, we're not autonomous, and we're, to we're totally interdependent. We are dependent, therefore. Um, and so this is the, the argument. And I say that as a result of that, this causes moral decadence and decay. Because when you prioritize the individual over and above the family units and the communal units, then what you have is you have the individuals atomized. This is the word they use, atomized in society. Almost as if to say that there is no common linkage between those individuals. Now, they've, the individual, individualists, the liberals, they come back and they say, but this is not necessarily the case. You can still give preference to the individual whilst at the same time, you know, considering communal linkages, etc. But the case stands for the com communitarians. They say, look, look at society. They look at sociological statistics. Say, so look at the uh, for instance, the amount of people, the amount of rape that's going on, the amount of murder that's going on, the amount of X, Y, Z, all of those things, the destruction of the family unit, and so on. You know, and they'll look at these indicators as indicative of the individualistic effect, if you like. This is the problem of liberalism, they would say. And there's there's an additional interesting um, criticism, which is that, and I think this was made by Michael Sandel, where he said that, look, Liberalism claims to be neutral. It claims to be neutral. So in other words, by nature, it doesn't try to favor any of any particular religious or moral ethic. It doesn't do that. But by giving individuals rights and defining what those rights are, you've introduced an ethic here which is biased by definition. So you can't maintain a neutral thesis and at the same time say, well, Individuals should be given preference because this would be a contradiction and this is a very good argument It's a very strong argument because how could it be the case that liberalism is on one hand neutral 
objective, meaning it's looking at all things equally, to use libertarian jargon, but at the same time, it's giving more preference to individual rights over and above familial and communal rights. This is not a neutral objective stance. And so someone like Michael Sandel will say, there should be a process of arbitration whereby all of the ideas, even if they are moral ideas, or if they are religious ideas, are put on the table and there is a democratization of ideas in this sense, and then a process of arbitration where we choose which ones we think are the right ones or the correct ones and so on, because the neutral thesis cannot be maintained. So if the mutual thesis cannot be maintained, you might as well put everything on the table and let people decide. And this is a very strong argument. But of course, this is where you find tensions between secularism, liberalism and democracy. Because we always think that liberal democracies, are, liberalism and democracy work hand in hand like a hand in a glove. But there are tensions between liberalism and democracy and secularism. And this is one of them. You can have illiberal democracies, it's possible. And you can have democratic tyrannies, that's also possible. So it's not necessarily the case that just because you have liberalism that you should have democracy and secularism as always following suit like a shadow of the intellectual ideology. No, it doesn't work like that. And so therefore, we see here some tensions because secularism, is the, you're divorcing the state and religion and the church. But according to these kinds of communitarian theses, you shouldn't divorce them. Because by divorcing them, you're not giving that human being in society an ability to express their identity in the most democratic or liberal way possible. You can't tell someone, look, be yourself, do whatever you want to do. And then they tell you, look, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Christian, I'm a Jew, and so on. And you say, but hold on, all of that stuff, we don't want to hear about it. But that's, that is what defines the individual. So a communitarian would say, this is a contradiction. You can't tell me to express myself, but then when I come to do so through religious um, terminologies, for example, or phraseologies, you tell me to be quiet. And this is why secularism is problematic from a liberal perspective. And that's never thought about. We always thought, well, why is secular, uh, secularism problematic? Then we go into religious jargon. Oh, because it goes against God's law and whatnot. We don't even need to go there. We can, we can show you how secularism is problematic from a liberal perspective. When was the last time you heard that ever being said by someone, right? Or liberalism is problematic from a democratic perspective. And so on. These tensions exist. So with this, I'm going to move on swiftly to the next part of this discussion, which I think is an easy way to segue now, because we talked about what are the problems in implementation with liberalism. And I've already kind of touched upon this, is that you have these superfluous notions, these abstracted notions that only make sense in the theoretical world. And one, once you put them in the real world, they don't really mean much. I'll give you a couple of examples. One of them is freedom. Obviously, a liberal believes in freedom, yes? So what is uh, liberalism? Say, look, it's freedom to do whatever I want to do. If you go in the dictionary, the Oxford Dictionary, say, go, define freedom. The ability to do whatever you want to do. The ability to do whatever you want to do. That's impossible for any human being. It's a utopian concept that has no bearing on the real world. How can you do whatever you want to do? You're always going to be curtailed by some kind of environmental or otherwise extraneous variable. Yes? If you go to the... Uh, Whatever example you want to give, I mean, everything you're, you can't do whatever you want to do. Simple as that. Right? You cannot do whatever you want to do. That's a false notion. So some define it, like Nozick and others, like some liberal thinkers, as freedom from coercion. So no one is stopping you to do certain things. Yes? And obviously this links to ideas of tyranny and obviously all those things. Let me give you a thought experiment to show you the, the problematic nature of this kind of conception. Let me give you two case studies. You have case study one. Somebody is there and you say, listen, you're going to do what I want or I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to kill you. Yes. 
what would you refer to that person as? A slave, yes? Because if they do what they want, this is, this is exactly how you make a slave a slave, right? If he doesn't do what you want, he, there are consequences. Death, for example. Okay. So is that person coerced? Yes, because you're, you're telling them, do this or else this. You're blackmailing them, yes? What if I say, you live in a very impoverished country and you have someone who's totally disenfranchised and the only option they have is to work. That's the only option they have, otherwise they're gonna die. You know, the, the only option they have is to work, otherwise they're gonna, a transnational company comes in and says, do what, do this, make this jumper. You're gonna work 12 hours, 18 hours. If not, we're gonna fire you. Yeah, you're finished. So what's really the difference? There's a lack of options on both of those, in both of those examples. You could argue, well, the second person has some degree of autonomy here. But what, what is that degree of autonomy? In, in both cases, if the person doesn't do what you want them to do, they're going to die. So the economic conditions led one person, yes, to be forced or coerced, in, in effect, into a certain reality. Wherein in the first example, obviously the, the, the violent ramifications led them to do what they want to do. So what is freedom then? We really have to reassess. If you ask a liberal, what is freedom? They won't give you a comprehensive answer. What is the freedom you're fighting for? What is the freedom you're dying for? They won't give you a comprehensive answer. They can't give you a comprehensive answer because as soon as you put this idea of freedom into the real world, all of, all of those questions come into play. We're not free. Simple as that. Like Rousseau said, man is born free but everywhere in chains. There is no uh, exact freedom here. There is only some freedoms, and that's all there will ever be, right? Another problematic notion is equality. You say, oh, we are born free. We are born equal. What do you mean we are born equal? Seriously, this is, it's problematic on every level. We're definitely not born equal. 100% not born equal by every psychological and scientific standard. That's the one thing we can guarantee that we're not born equal. Anything else you can guarantee but we're not born equal unless you have twins. That's maybe one case study where, okay, there's some, something to be said about that. But in most cases, we're born completely unequal. Psychologically, physiologically, biologically, emotionally. Totally unequal. We live in different parts of the world come from different families with different economic provisions. Some are born with diseases. Some others are not born with diseases. Some are born like this and some are born... Even John Locke admitted this himself in his two treatises of government that he wrote. One of the first books to kind of talk about the liberal position. So what do we actually mean we're born equal? It's just... What do we mean by that? How are we born equal? So... They've realized the problem with this. It's a problematic notion. What do we mean by equality? So they've had to refine it and say, look, there's a difference between equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. Yes? And what we're trying to do is secure an equality of opportunity, not an equality of outcome. Or some would say, yes, we want equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. But that's a discussion amongst themselves. But equality of opportunity is in and of itself impossible. What do you mean by equality of opportunity? What do you really mean by that? Do we all have the same? Should we all have the same opportunities? Because when you start bringing in the exception, then you're going to see too many exceptions. A disabled person, they don't have the same opportunities as the rest of us. Should they have? I mean, when I came into this uh, university, I'm sure you have like ramps and... <laughs> And, and, and lifts and whatever for disabled people that are not the same for uh, people that have functioning, fully functional uh, abilities. That's not equality of opportunity. Uh, should we have blind people driving buses? That's not, uh, that's not equality of opportunity. So well, we should have equality of opportunity. Therefore, blind people should drive buses. No. We have com <laughs> there are so many examples of where it makes sense for there not to be an equality of opportunity. So then we start questioning the whole precept. Yes, we start questioning the whole precept. To what extent should we have equality of opportunity? And 
Usually a generally accepted rule or maxim is where we don't define the exception by the rule. So you're not going to accept the rule by the exception. But when you have so many exceptions like this in society, then the rule becomes undefined now. It's problematic. And that's why they talk about this amongst themselves. How can we maintain an egalitarian, equal opportunity premise when we're doing all of these things? Yes? Not everyone can vote. Children can't vote. And so on. There's so many examples why they have reasons for it. But that's the, that's, the, that's the whole point. If you have reasons for it, it's not equality of opportunity. So these are some implementable things which are frankly contradictory when put into implementation. And shows you the feeble nature of liberalism. Especially when put in contra contradistinction with other ideologies like um, democracy and uh, secularism. It's a feeble nature. It's, what are you actually trying to say? All of your... Um, all of your precepts, when put into implementation, they change completely. But usually when I have a discussion about liberalism, I don't mention all of those points. I mention my main argument with liberalism is not the com communitarian argument, the ontological argument, the sociological It's not any of those things I've just mentioned. These are good arguments. Yes, you can use them. But the argument I use is what you call the epistemological argument. And this is a very important argument. I'm going to try and explain it to you, okay? What I'm saying is, why should we believe in liberalism? Now, someone will say, because it gives people all of those things we just said, freedom of opportunity, freedom of expression, and all those things. Someone, other people will say, what are the alternatives? Look at all, all of the other alternatives. You know, liberalism stops bloodshed. It stops people from killing each other. It allows cohesion and harmony and all that. No problem, I agree. And we, we are for all of those things. And by the way, there is an intersectionality. Like an, a, a, if you had a Venn diagram, or for example, from an Islamic perspective, all the things we believe in and all the things that are, are in liberal theory, there is a, you know, a flesh that joins, if you like, the two kinds of ethics. It's not like everything we uh, believe in is completely uh, in opposition to liberalism. There's a lot of things we agree with them. Anti-corruption, transparency in government, transparency generally speaking, you know, uh, tolerance for other people of other religions and so on. I mean, we, we agree with all of those things. In the Quran, la ikraha fi din, you know, there is no compulsion in religion. We are not against those principles, you know. But what we are saying is that why should we take this ideology on wholesale as if it is the truth? Because that's the way it's being marketed to us. Now someone will say, look, I mean, this is a, the sentiment that's kind of widespread in um, Western circles, and even now Eastern circles as well, that they try and keep away from religion. Say, so look, I don't want anything to do with religion. We've had the religious experiment in the West, and it went terribly bad. Look what the church did. It inhibited all the rationality and freedom of expression and thought, and we don't need this again. Yes, and their liberalism gives us a mechanism out of this. Yes. It gives us a mechanism out of all of this. So we need liberalism to ensure rationality, etc. And to ensure expression and ideas are continually debated in public and whatnot. That's a fair enough argument. But here's the problem. Liberalism itself can be seen as a religion. What is religion? Now obviously if you look in the dictionary definition of what religion is, they will connect it with things like God and or some sacred thing that is worshipped or and so on. But the truth is, if you look terminologically at the word religion and some of the definitions of the word religion in, for example, anthropology, history, sociology and, and so on, you'll find that religion has more inclusive definitions. Any system of life, a social structure, an idea that explains the meaning of life. For example, Bayan and I'll try and put his, maybe his, um, his reference in the description box to this video. He has like a comprehensive uh, definition like this in a book called The World Religions or something of that nature. So if you have such an inclusive definition which includes fundamentally the ideologies, then really liberalism is a religion. Because it's a, an organization of ideas which allows people to live a life in a certain way and to think of themselves ontologically in a certain context, in a certain way. So really and truly, 
from an Islamic perspective especially, I mean the word deen, the way of life. The word deen means way of life, right? So liberalism is a deen of some sorts in the Arabic language, certainly from our conception it is. And that's what we have to think of it as. Liberalism is a deen with, with khawaid and usul and furu'ah and all of these things. It has fundamentals, it has everything. Liberalism is a deen. And we're looking at some of the usul now and thinking, okay, the usul, the foundational premises of liberalism, and thinking there's some problems with the usul. And I'll give you a few examples. If you look at the initial works of people like John Locke, who, who is probably the most prominent liberal who ever lived, and one of the most influential men who ever lived, yeah? He wrote a book called The Tru Two Treatises of Government. And you'll find that in, in his explanation of how, what are we basing liberalism on? He based it on, you could say, two or three different principles. Two of them I'm going to outline to you now. One of them, the idea of being born equal and free, is taken from theology. It says God-given rights. There's no doubt about it. John Locke believed in God. He believed in, by the way, he was not a Trinitarian, which is quite interesting. Yeah? He rejected the Trinity. He's quite a clever man. Yes. He rejected the Trinity, but he still believed in God. So John Locke, he based his philosophy on two premises. One of them is called the hedonistic principle. Some say hedonistic. Tomato, tomato. No problem. Yeah. What is hedonism? What is hedonism? Hedonism is the idea, it's really like pain and pleasure. Yes, it's pain and pleasure. So you're trying to maximize pain, you're trying to maximize pleasure. Yes, not maximize pain. <laughs> and you're trying to minimize pain. That's the, that is really it. Yeah. And the other thing is that we're endowed these equal and free rights from God. This tradition of hedonism or hedonism was continued up until... For example, John Stuart Mill, another very important figurehead in liberalism. So what do liberals base their philosophy on? The idea that you yourself, as an individual, have the best understanding of yourself and what makes you happy. And therefore, you have to minimize as much of life's pains as possible and maximize as much of life's pleasures as possible, so long as you don't harm anyone else. And this is the harm principle that John, Prince, uh, John Stuart Mill put into play. So long as you don't harm anyone else. This is liberalism. So long as you don't harm anyone else through fraud or forgery, because that's an invalid type of action in liberalism. That's, that's basically it. But if we take a step back and say, but hold on. Okay, no problem. I understand where you're coming from. But the issue is this. The issue is, how can you prove the hedonistic principle as a true, morally objective moral? I'm not talking about something you feel as a subjective experience, where you say, I like this and I don't like this. Everyone can have their own subjective beliefs. But from a morally realist perspective, there's no way of proving this is the truth. So there is a degree of axiomacity, which means an axiom is something you, you believe in without evidence. That's what an axiom is. So there is a degree of axiomacity involved in believing the hedonistic principle. You believe it without evidence, basically. So you believe in a, a, a whole philosophy, a whole political philosophy, a whole ideology, which you've based your whole Western empire on, but really, when we get down to the first principles, we realize there is nothing proving that at all. It is a subjective value judgment of a man, an English man named John Locke, and then his disciples and followers, and those who expounded upon his philosophy, who lived in the 17th and 18th century. He died in the 18th century. This is, a, this is where you're taking your ideology from. So... Hedonism has to be looked at very closely here. Epistemologically, are we saying that hedonism, yes, is true, is a truth? Just in the same way as 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true. Yes, that's a mathematical truth. You can argue otherwise. Some people have, by the way. 
We're not going, going to go into that much deep philosophy today. But just in the same way as 2 plus 2 equals, obviously the Christians, you know, 1 plus 1 plus 1. I'm not going to make any jokes here, but, but you know, I mean, <laughs> but 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a mathematical truth, yes? So can we say that hedonism, the idea that there's pain and pleasure and they constitute for us basically the ultimate God. That's what Bentham called them. And I was, subhanAllah, I was actually amazed when I read this. He says, you have two lords, Bentham, a uh, utilitarian. He, he, Bentham was a great contributor to the liberal tradition, even though he didn't agree with it. He said, there's two lords, pain and pleasure. And you know when he said this, I remembered the ayah in the Quran. He says, أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَهَهُ هَوَىٰ Have you seen the one who has taken his desires as his God? SubhanAllah, everything is in, يعني, is in the Quran. مَا فَرَطْنَا فِي الْكِتَابِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Allah has put everything in there. The same person who existed a long time ago, now he's justified his, 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 his animalism, right? His hedonism. So, I don't know if animalism is the right word, by the way. Yes, but th that's, that's the point here, yeah? So you can't prove that liberalism is true. They'll say, we know that. A lot of them will agree to that. I was, re I was reading, for example, John uh, Chavez, I think his name is. He, he's got a book talking about the UN. It's called something like Liber uh, Human Rights and the Liberal Project. And basically, he's saying we should use the UN to liberalize, basically, the, uh, the illiberals. The illiberals, and he uses three or four examples of illiberals, and one of the main ones he uses in his book is Muslim, are Muslims, Orthodox, traditional Muslims. We need to liberalize them. We need to make them think like us, liberalize them. And this is what I'm going to move on to, the effect on Muslims. You see, just like back in the days where people used to worship statues. Yes, they used to worship, and even now, I mean, they used to worship, and they still worship statues. You know, statues, what's going on here, man? We've gone past this. You don't worship a statue? Why do we worship a sanam, a statue? Yes? Why are you doing that? He can't help you. He can't, you know, do anything for you. And you ask them, says, because my forefathers did it. Yeah? My forefathers. Nowadays, if you ask that person, if you ask them, you know, why are you worshipping a statue? Have you got any evidence for this? They say, no, I don't really have any evidence. But my forefathers were doing it, etc. And, and they're just so, you know, deeply involved in the culture of the day. That is difficult to break away from it, to the statue. But we look at those historical moments and we think, that's very weird. But the truth is, history is present because that's exactly what liberals do. Uh, the, the, the same as, axiomatity applies. You cannot prove that that, that uh, particular statue can help you. In the same way, you can't prove that liberalism is true. In the same exact way, from an epistemological perspective, there's no difference. You worshipping that statue is the same as uh, basically believing in liberalism. What's the difference? If you look at first principles, you can't prove. They're both unprovable. They're unprovable. So from that perspective, it's a religion. It must be seen as a religion. And those individuals now, and maybe, in our, maybe you know some of them, maybe I know some of them, secular liberal-minded liberal, liberal -minded kind of individuals, say, look, I'm not into religion. Say, listen, you are into religion, man. Say, I've had enough of smoking cigarette, you know, and they're with their friends outside of a club, and you, you tell them, Taqillah, you know, have fear of Allah. Come on, it's haram what you do. And they're smoking. I'm not into religion, you know what I'm trying to say. Say, wait a minute, hold on, man, you are a religious guy. You're a liberal, you believe in liberal principles. You say, why are you not into religion? Because, you know, it's done this and it's done that, and I just believe in this. I believe we should all be free, and I believe in this, and I believe it, there should be no constraints, and this... Well, you're just giving me your religious principles and you're telling me you're not into religion. These are religious principles. Let's change the language. They don't like that language because it makes them look like going back into the Dark Ages. But they have to know that they're already in the Dark Ages. And there's no necessary link, by the way, between technology and liberalism. There's absolutely none. Because just because the Western world found, uh, you know, there was the Industrial Revolution followed by many other events that happened in history in the 17th and 18th century, which coincided with the liberal project, it doesn't mean that liberalism was the cause for any of that. In other words, some people have this false assumption when you're looking at, and this is a post-colonial reality, when you're looking at Americans or 
English people or French people say, look, they have clean streets, they have technology in their countries and so on. This must be because of what they believe in. What's, what's that got to do with what they believe in? Go to Japan. They've got even cleaner streets and they've got even bigger uh, cities. They're not the same as those individuals. Technology is something completely independent, completely independent from ideology. That's the whole point of technology. It's something which is independent. So you can't link those two things. Look, you know, ever since we've become liberal, all of these good things have happened to us. It's good. There is no necessary link. Correlation does not entail causation. It's one of the fallacies they use. So don't connect those two things together. And as we're in Turkey, obviously, the best people that should know this are the Turks themselves. Yes, what do you mean by that, man? Are you trying to be political? Are you trying to get us arrested? No, no, I'm not going to go anywhere. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything controversial. But what I am going to say is that think of the history of the Turkish, right? I mean, if we wanted to make this false argument, and it is a false argument, I would say, well, actually, Turkey and its history indicates to us the closer they have been to Quran and Sunnah, the more technology they've had and the more militarily successful they've been. Look at 1453. There was no liberalism there. Tell me, 1453, what happened? When Muhammad Fatah, yeah, go ahead, I, I'll give it away. Yes, in, this is Constantinople, yes? Istanbul is Constantinople. 1453, this was before John Locke was even uh, born. There was no liberalism at this time. Yeah, you can't say, well, you know, the Turks, we, we were very successful because of liberalism. 1453 was one of the biggest military successes of all time, in all of history. And there was no liberalism involved in that. So we're not going to make a false argument here and say that just because you, you are Muslim, you, oh, tilkal ayam, nudawilu habayna nas. Allah says in the Quran, some days, these are the days which we alternate between the people. Some days the, 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 the non-Muslims will be successful and other days the Muslims will be successful. It's nothing to do. It has something to do with ideology to some, to some our spiritual perspective. But from their secular perspective, it has nothing to do with it. So they can't use that argument, right? But now there are two things. If you really think about it deeply, if you wanted to co compile an exhaustive list of how they're trying to liberalize us, it boils down to two things, media and education. And we're here in a university, yeah? I thought about this quite deeply, yeah? And I thought, really, it boils down to two things, media and education. And the final message I want to leave to the, because I don't want to, I want to make this into an interactive session, inshallah, because we want to bring the everyone up so we can have a question and answer but the final message I want to put to the people here today is that look they couldn't colonize the Turks they, and they were, by the way if you look at the old history and the records they were very angry about this they were jealous <laughs> there were times in history if you read the colonial histories of the English they were very they were very jealous basically of the Turkish uh, people because of what they were able to do, especially in the like 15th century, 16th, when it was a strong empire. They yeah, were very jealous. And they were still, you know, at this time, because the English, they only started to become quite powerful, maybe in the 17th century, yes? The age of discovery and so on, when they found, they found land, yeah? Yes, it was a considerable chunk of land, United States and, you know, Canada and all those things. But they found land, yeah? The point I'm making to you is, they couldn't colonize the Turks uh, militarily. But we're in, a, we're in a point in history now where they're trying to colonize the Turks ideologically. And I believe, I'm sorry to say, looking at the data from Pew Research and other things, I feel like now Turkey is at a crossroads. And so is the rest of the Muslim world. Where colonization might not be happening militarily, but it might very well be happening ideologically. And they're using media and they're using education to force their false to force their false gods on you. And they're not even telling you; they're not even giving you a reason why to believe in that th that, that thesis, why to believe that we are the you know we are in charge of ourselves and we know the best and and we are our own gods basically. They want you to be your own god. But we are saying to you that don't, you know we believe in La Ilaha Illallah. We believe in that there's no god worthy of worship except for Allah. Yes, and whenever we believed in that, like Ibn Khaldun said in his Muqaddimah, it's an interesting thing. He says that when a, when a civilization has that belief 
and they don't fear death. Because a, necessarily, a necessary result of believing in Islam is that you care less about this life. Yeah? And by extension, you care less about death. And what that does to a community and society is, to be honest with you, it makes it more brave. And the more brave a society is, the more dangerous it is to other societies, in the sense that it cannot be manipulated or messed around on an international level. Yeah? So they're afraid of that. If you go back to La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, you will have an advantage from that perspective. Otherwise, let the colonization begin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.